All right, everyone, I'm going to start now. It's recording. It won't upload to Teams, so I'll edit the recording after the class when I'm finished, and then I'll upload it to Moodle after. Um, apologies for my voice. It's a bit crackly. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, so we missed last week. So by this stage, uh, you should know that the tutorials are starting this week. So as I said in the email, if you haven't yet got a tutorial slot, please contact the sociology department. If you open up the chat here as well, you'll see there's a link uh, to my notice that I put up originally with this invite. And there's also uh, an address, sociology.department.nu.ie. So if you're having any trouble with registration, if you didn't get to register, if you have any questions about the venues or anything, just send it on to them. Anything to do with scheduling, just send it on to the main office. Um, I don't control that, and rightly so, because I'd probably make a mess of it if I did. So just drop them an email and they should hopefully, uh, they should be able to help you out. Okay, uh, I got some assignment questions over the weekend. I'll address those now, but the tutors are also going to talk to you about it next week. This week, sorry. Um, if there's any questions that you want me to answer about the assignment or the material or anything, you can put them in the chat. Uh, you don't need to unmute yourselves. You can if you want, but I know people don't really like doing that. So if you've got a question or anything, you can type it into the comments, the chat uh, the chat window here, and I'll answer it for you. I'm doing it any time. I'll check back through the lecture to see if anyone has any questions. Uh, one I did get, two questions I did get, sorry, were about the bibliography and the word count. So I've stated on the assignment brief that it is inclusive of word count. That's 1,200 inclusive. Uh, that's generally because with this assignment, uh, it's just kind of about identifying the different parts of the, um, the article. There's generally not a lot of external referencing that goes into this one. This one is just about getting you to identify identify the article. So to write the reference in proper format, whether it's Oscar or Harvard, and to get you to identify the various components of the article. You're welcome to reference the textbooks for this course. Um, of course, any outside referencing you can do will be looked on favorably. But this one is probably lighter on citation than the other one. The focus of this assignment really is on your chosen article. So I'll edit the um, course outline and the assignment outlines as well, just to make that absolutely clear that this one is inclusive of word count, the 1,200 words. The other question I got was about uh, the level of detail you need. Again, one of the questions for assignment one is about identifying the research methods and methods of analysis that the authors use. And for those, you don't need anything too uh, extensive or too detailed. It's just about identifying, being able to read the article, identify the parts is the main thing. I'm going to share my screen with you now and I'll talk you through that. So I'm sharing my screen with you. You should be able to see a PowerPoint um, if anyone could just type in the chat, yes or OK, if you can see the PowerPoint, then I can move on. Just let me know if you can see that. All right. And if you can hear me and see me, of course. Yeah. OK. If the audio is OK, just let me know as well. Or it's not OK. Sorry. Just let me know as well. So the parts of the assignment that we need to keep an eye on are, uh, first of all, the first one. What is the main research problem or question of the study? This is just about identifying the core objectives. Again, the tutors will go through this with you. You'll have plenty of time this week to ask them questions if you want as well. So it's really just about summarizing uh, as concisely as you can what actually the object, the objective of the paper is. What is the research question? Um, we've got a slide on research questions at the end of this presentation. Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> identify the research methods that are used. So this is about how the data is collected. And we discussed in week one and in the video for last week, because we had no live class last week, I talked about how you might identify the orientation, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, based on how the data were collected. So if the authors used interviews, if they used surveys, some of them it'll be very obvious. They'll talk quite obviously about using or adopting statistical methodologies, or they'll say that they've interviewed a number of respondents. So this is about using what you know now about the general features of qualitative and quantitative to identify which method on which method type was used. How are the data sampled? We'll cover that today. What methods were used to analyze the data? Again, this is about identification. Uh, papers can use different methods of analysis. Some of them can be quite complicated. 
So if the authors are using, let's say, regression analysis, you don't need to describe what that is. You don't need to go into detail about, you know, you don't need to you know, assess whether it's appropriate. We haven't done that yet, and we're not going to cover that in this course, really. So it's just about being able to find the relevant section where they discuss the analysis. It's about getting you to read it, really. So whether it's statistical analysis, whether it's secondary analysis, qualitative thematic analysis, whatever, identify the methods um, and include a reference, let's say, to the paper. Quote it, obviously, when you say, when you do find it, and then um, quote the relevant place in the paper where it is, I mean. And the last one, really, it, of all those four questions, A, B, C, and D, those are um, the most straightforward in terms of identification. Question E is the important one. This is the one to really keep an eye on. Do you find the author's conclusions convincing, given their methods of sampling, data collection, and analysis? So what we talked about, or we'll talk about, um, what we mentioned briefly in the first part, the second part, and we'll also talk about next week, is the question of um, validity. So do you find that the study design lends itself to, does it inspire confidence in you that the data collection was valid, the measures were valid? Again, that's kind of coming next week. Was the sample of adequate coverage and size? We'll know that by the end of today. Considering how the data was presented and discussed, are you satisfied that you've been given sufficient detail based on how they've described their methodology that allows you to answer that question, you know, that allows you to assess the quality of the paper. These would include things like quality control over the data collection, the sampling, the analysis, the description, the level of detail at which they describe what they did, the replicability, could you reproduce that study if you wanted? Did they design their own survey instruments? Is there evidence that they piloted them? Did they discuss the ethical implications? What concepts were explored in the study? So each of those papers will deal with different core concepts, things like power, gender, class, inequality, but also more like self-evident concepts, I suppose, like crime control, legality, and things like that. How did they explore those? So this question is about your assessment of the paper, your assessment of the quality of the paper, given how they've sampled the data, how they've collected the data, and how they've analyzed it. I'll just check back to see if there's any questions. OK, no questions in the chat at the moment. Sorry, Laura, here you've got one. How many references would be expected for this kind of assignment? Um, I don't put a number on these, really. What I would expect at a minimum is that you cite the your chosen paper properly and that you make some reference to the course reading. That could be any of the core readings from any of the core textbooks, uh, the shut chapter, the joke book. Any of those really would do. And I don't like to pin a number on this because, again, we're not marking you for quantity in this respect. We're marking you on the quality of it. I'll give different guidelines for uh, for the third assignment. Uh, there will be an expectation in that of kind of referencing and engagement with outside sources. So I will give you, I promise I won't be as vague as this for the third one, I will give you a number for that. But for this one, really, the expectation is that you cite the article and that you just show some evidence that you've looked at some of the core readings, the required readings for the course. And that can be any of them. Again, I've given a list of books. Some of them are online, some of them are print. So as long as, you, as, long as you've shown me some evidence that you've uh, been engaging with course readings, then that should be fine. Okay, we've got 56. Someone have a hand up. I don't know, does this version of Teams automatically show me if you do or not? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, so any other questions, just put them in the chat. I'll start the class and I'll check back in a couple of minutes and see if anyone has any questions. So I'm actually going to do the sampling stuff first, I think. I'll come back to this at the end. So one of the most important things about research is the notion of generalizability. It's one of the things we aim to establish in research. In the first reading for the course for week one, uh, in the Bachman and Schutt book, they talk about these sort of aims of research. What are we trying to do in research? And we're trying to establish, we're try, we try to design studies that are rigorous. And to do that, we need to do a number of things. We need to pay attention to how we design the research, that we select the appropriate methods of data collection for the type of question we have. Next week, we'll see how when we study things, when we try and actually measure concepts in reality and we try to measure something like fear of crime like you look at in tutorial next week we need to ensure the measures are valid that they actually reflect the questions we ask reflect the concepts that we want to study another important thing we're often trying to establish is what we refer to as generalizability and there are two types of generalizability generally speaking there's sample and cross-population so for any study really for any study we're faced with this sort of ever-present problem, which is that as much as we would like to interview everybody, as many people as we possibly could, resources, 
time funding simply means that we don't have the time to do that. We don't have the resources to do that. So instead, in the social sciences and criminology, we work with samples. We take a subsample or a smaller subset of the group or the population that we're interested in and we study them. And we do that with a view to saying that based on the characteristics of this small group that I've studied, this sample, that I can make projections about how the wider population behave. And again, this is really an ever present phenomenon, especially in your third year dissertations. If you do go on to do them, those of you that do, you will come up against the issue of sampling in a one year project. You don't have the resources to interview everybody. So you have to take a smaller sample of maybe eight to 10 people. If you're administering a survey, you might take a sample of 50 to 60 people. And that just means, and that's a resource issue. That's simply because we can never hope to possibly interview everybody that we wish. So sample generalizability is the question of whether the people that we have studied are generalizable to the wider population of interest. This is most obvious if we look at things like political opinion polls. So I mentioned in week one that every week, you know, the various newspapers publish opinion polls on different issues. And um, these are usually conducted by companies like Red Sea, Ipsos and places like that. And what they're trying to do there is to establish sample generalizability. They interview a small sample of 800 to 1200 people. And then they do some adjustments. They control who they sample, where they sample the characteristics and so on. And then they try to establish whether or if their sample is applicable or generalizable to the population of Ireland. In other words, when they publish their opinion polls, they're making claims about the population of Ireland that public support for this political party is 20% support for or the approval rating of this politician is 50% or whatever. And that's a question of sample generalizability. They're projecting that from the subsample of Irish people to the population of Ireland. The other way in which we might want to establish generalizability is what we call cross population generalizability. And this is a big issue for us in criminology because Quite often, a lot of the research that we draw on is not based on research done in Ireland. And you saw this in week one when we discussed questions of racial and ethnic discrimination. We discussed application of capital punishment. Obviously, we don't have capital punishment in Ireland. But other questions that we might look at will be things like the applicability of different branches of theory, like labeling theory, procedural justice theory. But also, as we'll see in a couple of weeks time, if we look at something like the crime and justice surveys, uh, crime and victimization surveys that we look at in Britain and Scotland, let's say, sorry, England, England, Wales and, and Scotland, so England and Wales run their surveys together. Scotland does a separate one. And the question that we might ask there is, do those figures or are those findings on, let's say, the relationship between age and fear of crime? We know that older people tend to be more fearful of crime. People in rural areas tend to be more fearful of crime. If we're raising the question of cross population generalizability, then we're asking the question, does that finding that we find for the people of um, England and Wales or the people of Scotland, does that also hold in the Irish case? Or could we say based on Scottish data that we would find the same age related effect in Ireland, that older people would report higher levels of fear? Other ways or places that you'll find this question of cross population generalizability are around things like social policy interventions. We have a lot of international evidence that shows things like if we increase public spending on, let's say, public health care or public treatment programs, that it reduces arrests or recidivism for drug related offences. And we might often be reading this research or pilot research based on based out of countries like, let's say, Sweden or the United States. And then the question we often have to ask as researchers is, well, is there an element of cross population generalizability here? Could we apply those findings to, or if we were to implement the same program in Ireland, would it be effective? Would the impact pathways be the same? And again, this is getting on to later in the course in week 10, we'll look a little bit at evaluation research um, to see how that might work. Any other questions on the assignment? Nothing so far. OK. So before we consider or before we talk about I suppose how we establish sampling, we need to understand a couple of basic concepts about working with samples. And the two key terms here really are sampling error and sampling variation. Whenever we work with a sample, we are going to introduce the possibility for these two sources of error. And these errors are ever present whenever we sample anything, whenever we interview a subset of respondents, whenever we administer a survey to a subset of respondents, we always introduced or we're always presented with the question of sample generalizability and some of the factors that might affect that generalizability then 
our sampling error and sampling variation. So the concepts are important and we're not going to go too much into the mechanics or statistics of this because again, that's not what this course is about. But let's imagine that we have these three bubbles represent the class currently. Let's imagine we have um, a class, I haven't counted this, whatever, how many individuals are in this. And let's say that we want to understand or we want to measure what the average income, let's say the average annual income is for this group of people. Um, one thing, and now let's, before we do this exercise, let's assume that we know, let's assume in advance that we have interviewed every single one of these people. We've asked them only one question. We asked them, what's your annual average, average annual income? And we know that the true score, the true figure is 24,500. Now, in reality, this is typically unknown. If we want to measure fear of crime or um, experience of crime, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know what the population rate is, okay? because we don't ask questions like that in the census. There's no you know, population level survey. So whenever we try and measure something in the social sciences, we really don't know what the true population value is or what the true population level attitude is. So let's imagine this, and this is kind of an exercise in demonstrating how the, how the phenomena of sampling error and sampling variation work. Let's imagine we take a sample of six people, right? We take six people from this group and we just administer that question to them. We ask, what's your average income? What's your income? What's yours, 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 and so on. We take the average of this subsample, this six. And in this first sample, we get a score of 25,000. Now let's put those people back in, right? Replace them and we redraw another random sample, these six people. Okay, different sample, we now ask them the same question, and this time we get an average of these six people of 23,000. And we do it again, return those people to the sampling frame, resample again at random, and this time we get a score for this group of 27,000. Now this shows us two things. First of all, if we know what the true population value is, then we know or we see that each of these scores produces a deviation. This one overestimates, this one underestimates, and this one overestimates. So you can see here that this one is out by about 500 euros. This one is under by 1500. This one is over by 2500. This is sampling error. This is the difference between the population value, the true population value, and what we observe in our sample. So for this group, the average is 24,500. For the subsample, it's 25,000. So we've got a sampling error of 500. Sampling variation then is simple fact that as we resample, as we repeat this exercise for each of these different instances, sample one, sample two, sample three, we're going to get a different score. So you see here that these vary. 25,000 is different to 23,000 is different to 27,000. And this is sampling variation. It means that when we take a sample, we get a score. But if we take another sample from that group, we get a different score, a different score. So sampling error and sampling variation simply means that inherently, whenever we work with samples, we introduce a degree of error. In this case, mean income comes with not just the difference between the population score and the sample score, but also the fact that every time we do this, we're going to get a different, a different figure. Some will be over, some will be under. And the trick with a lot of statistical analysis is that we can, we can actually use the known properties of this resampling phenomenon, the sampling error phenomena, we can apply some fairly simple mathematics and we can get some pretty good approximations or estimates of what the true population value might, or at least where it might be likely to sit. Nonetheless, all we need to know or all you need to understand from this is that whenever we work with samples, there's a degree of error. And the, one of the ways we try and control for this is through our sampling strategy. It's by sampling carefully and making sure we sample the right people and the various groups are represented. So to give you an example of this in practice, in the last US presidential election, there was a very clear um, distinction or difference, at least at most points in the race between, and this is just the presidential election between Trump and Biden. So on the top, we've got Biden's score. This is in time series from April 2020 all the way down to October 2020. We've got Biden up here on the top, the triangles and Trump with the circles. So we see here that almost at every point, apart from this point here, which is between April and June, they're fairly far apart in terms of their popularity. So Biden is clearly on top for most of these. But the problem is that all of these opinion polls are based on sample data. They take a sample of about 1,500 individuals from the American public. They ask them, um, or they measure the, what you're looking at here is the percentage who would vote for Trump, percentage who would vote for Biden. 
And for each of these percentages, these estimates, there's going to be a margin of error, right? Because it's sample data, um, for this point in time, let's say, the April, the April data point, if they had resampled or taken a different group of respondents, then Biden's score might be here, but the next group it might be here. Equally for Trump, it could be both as well. If we were to just isolate uh, the score for Trump, this one here, and look at it a bit differently, and we were to superimpose that error over it, what we would find is that actually there is a limit or there's a range within which Trump's true population level approval rating could have actually fallen. Now, the trick here is that it's more likely to have fallen closer to here, closer to the estimated score, but it could be anywhere in between here. And oftentimes in opinion polls, you'll see that they come with this, what they call a 3% margin of error. So if they estimate at this point in time that Trump's um, voting, sorry, the percentage who would vote for Trump in an election in the morning is 37%, then it could be 40, but equally it could be 34. If we superimpose both of those error bars over it, you'll see here that actually this is quite important because especially when their scores are close like this, we can't really be sure that there's a true or a meaningful difference between Trump and Biden here. Equally, you see here, at some points, they actually overlap. So at this point, it's possible that Trump's score could have been higher, Biden's score could have been lower. And this is sampling error in practice. It's the simple fact that because we're working with a sample, there is a difference between the true population mean and the sample mean. And you'll often see these things like this given. More oftentimes when you read a poll, they'll simply say plus or minus 3%. This is what it means. It means that there's a margin of error of 3%. The population score might lie somewhere in between there. If any questions or anything, just put them in the chat and I'll check in in a second. So if we look just at that data point there, that particular score there between April and June, we see that it's May 6th, sorry. So Reuters reported or recorded Trump at 38, Biden at 39, and this was officially the closest it ever came in the race. From that point on, they were fairly well distanced, and by the election, by election night, they were pretty well differentiated. So factoring the margin of error, it's possible that Biden was at 36, possible but less likely, and that Trump was at 41. So really, at this point, we don't know where the overlap actually is. We don't really know for certain whether Biden is ahead, whether Trump is ahead. We can be reasonably sure. It's more likely that he was, but we can't be entirely sure. If we look at, or if we go back to the previous election, then before this one in 2016, um, this was an interesting one in many respects because the predictions were solidly in favor of Hillary Clinton winning the election for a very, very long time. In fact, if we just take it from June to, uh, to mid-November, you can see here that barring this sort of little blip here in the July-August interval, they were actually quite well differentiated, especially in October. And this was a problem. This was really an issue for lots of polling agencies because so many of them got it got it so wrong. And these are all the different polls that were produced and the dates on which they were produced. There's, you know, you go, you probably recognize a lot of these sources. There's New York Times, there's Fox. And for every single one of these, apart from the IBD one, they have Clinton with a fairly clear lead. And that lead varies anywhere between two to six. Uh, that's percentage points. So for this one here, let's say Fox News have Clinton on 48, Trump on 44. The only one that measures Trump as ahead is a margin of two, 43 and 41. And there was a sense from this, of course, that after the election occurred, um, that something that went really, really wrong, that actually this is a really clear demonstration for the first time that maybe some of the polling methodologies might not be all they were all they were supposed to be. And now one of the factors behind this, of course, was that a lot of these polling agencies uh, in the past, they would have used something like random digit dialing. And what that meant was they uh, they would have dialed a random number, got to a household, they would have answered, asked the question. And over time, as people began to adopt mobile phone technologies, they realized that this was becoming, becoming biased because with mobile phone numbers, cell phone numbers unlisted, it meant that you were getting a biased sample, more likely people were gonna have a landline. They were also more likely to be low income households. But the opposite thing happened with the Clinton poll. That a lot of these opinion polls were issued online. They were also voluntary. They were sort of self-selecting in respects, and that we know those more likely to be spending more time online were also those who were slightly more highly educated, um, who had jobs that required them to be online anyway, so they were computer literate. So there was a bias. There was a class bias in this poll, and that consistently what they were doing was overestimating the Clinton vote share because 
the pollsters were simply reaching more affluent respondents. They weren't getting the low-income voters who turned out for Trump, and as a result, the final election score was actually very much in favour of Donald Trump, as we remember in whenever it was 2017. If we look at the total polling errors, um, if we think of this in terms of poll accuracy as well, there's another issue, which is that polls really don't become too accurate or too predictive until really closer to the election time. In fact, there's a huge variation in the margin of error. It's the mean absolute error simply means that they're out by, depending on where they fall, four points or five points or up to, yeah, five points here and three points there. But it's only when we get to the election time the date of the election that they actually start to become a bit more accurate where that margin of error drops to within about one to two points so there's a time effect as well so one of the big questions they asked was why did we not see it coming or why didn't we see trump's victory coming the answer is many people did of course i mean those who were keeping an eye on the polling methodologies kind of had an inkling about it um places like pew political economy work group uh, research group sorry but what they found afterwards was that, especially in the case of online polling, there was a massive selection bias. The sample was mainly self-selecting because it depended on access to IT, it depended on access to the internet, and it depended on access to mobile technology and uh, computers. There was also a non-response bias. So these are important. I mean, who is more likely to answer a question? Who's less likely to answer a question? We know that less educated voters are less likely to respond to polls or to answer poll questions. So that non-response bias compounds the bias that we find here through selection that they're getting more educated respondents mainly who are more likely to vote for Clinton. <coughs> Excuse me. And also there was an element of misunderstanding. And there's often been, there often is a fundamental element of misunderstanding in these that really that given the sample sizes that these polls work within a margin of error that's approximately plus or minus 3%. So at the public level, certainly, there was a misunderstanding of, and you see this in the papers as well in the media, these things are often presented as or represented as being relatively straightforward, whereas in reality, the margins of error can be quite, can, 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 can be quite considerable. We consider smaller parties in those votes as well, and um, that becomes especially problematic. So this summarizes for us some of the key terms that we've come across here. A sample is simply a subset of the population that we choose for research. Again, we can't interview everybody, we can't study everybody, so we take a sample. The population is the group to whom we wish to generalize our findings. Now, population, that's an important term to, to get right, because when we talk about population and sampling, we are not talking about like the, necessarily the population of a country. In the case of the opinion polls, quite clearly, yes, we are talking about countries and country level. But oftentimes, our population is simply the target group that we want to generalize our findings to. So in the interview data that you're going to look at in week six or seven, the target population in those cases is the population of individuals who have been through the probation system, generally speaking, young people who have been through the probation system. If we were doing a study of homeless people and we took a sample of homeless people to interview, then our target population would be the homeless population. We would often be more specific than that. We would say the homeless population of Dublin, the homeless people of Ireland, the homeless people of a particular region. So ultimately what we're doing is by looking at or taking, by paying attention to the rules of sampling, how we draw a sample, and also those issues of methodology that we saw on the previous slide, we're trying to ensure that we draw a representative sample. And a representative sample is one that captures all the subgroups of importance to the research question. If we go back to the previous example of the Clinton-Trump opinion polls, then we can see quite clearly that this sample is not representative because it's not capturing all the subgroups of interest. The subgroups of interest here are voters or respondents of different social classes. We need high income, but we also need low income. And you can see if we don't do that, if we don't represent those subgroups, we get a biased sample. We get one that's not representative and we can't really have any confidence in the findings. And this goes for anything. This goes for any piece of research we conduct in criminology that uses samples. We're always trying to ensure that our sample is representative. So how do we do that? We do that by paying attention to how the samples are selected. We pay attention to the subgroups and we also pay attention to um, how respondents are selected in the first place, whether it's at random or whether it's through a process of onward referral or whether we specifically seek them out. The first type of sampling that we look at is what we call probability sampling. And this is often used in quantitative research, most often used in quantitative research. And probability sampling is probably what we best understand as random sampling. 
And randomization is an important assumption of many statistical tests and procedures. Uh, if we want to analyze something using a particular set of statistical techniques, oftentimes one of the assumptions and one of the requirements of using those methods is that our sample be drawn at random, that we have a random or truly random sample. Now, in reality, that's the vast majority of times, certainly in criminology and sociology, that's not the case. Um, either we can't ensure randomization or we don't. With large scale survey data, secondary survey data, it is the case. But there's a lot of instances where we might not necessarily be able to ensure randomization. And probability sampling is a sampling technique where the probability of selection for each subject is known. We'll contrast this in a moment with non probability sampling, which is used in qualitative research. So the simplest way, the easiest way to remember these is probability sampling, quantitative research, non probability sampling, qualitative research. It's a big generalization. Again, there's overlap. You can use non-probability samples in quantitative, but let's keep things simple for the moment. So how probability sampling works is it typically employs a sampling frame. And a sampling frame is a list of all the respondents or all the individuals that we could study or we could research. In the past, we would have used things like electoral registers, electoral registers, which are notoriously unreliable now, of course, there's duplicate entries and all sorts of things. Uh, we would have used phone records, but they're less reliable now that people have switched from landlines to mobile phones. Or if we were looking at an organization or a company, we might use employee lists. If you were doing a study of social workers, maybe you might be able to get a list of registered practitioners. Or if you were doing a study of a particular organization, like say a factory or an industry, maybe it's possible to get a list of employees. The point is we can only employ probability sampling where we have this kind of exhaustive list, this sampling frame, because again, that's the only way to know the probability of selection. Why do we use these? We use them for large n. So in notation, we often use this small, this n, lowercase n to refer to sample and an uppercase n to refer to population. So large n samples are large, uh, those with large numbers of people in them. What constitutes a large sample? There's no threshold, really. Small samples, you're talking about 50, although some statistical techniques can accommodate somewhat smaller samples and very small samples in some cases. <laughs> Large scale representative samples in public surveys, you're usually talking about 1,500 to 2,500. Um, the EU Silk uh, has about 1,850 households in it and about, I'm probably going to get this wrong, I think it's 10,000 individuals. Um, and that's the survey of income and living conditions, nationally representative sample and so on. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about the coffee. So we use these where generalizability is a goal. Now, at the start, I mentioned generalizability is always a goal. So is there an instance where we might not be looking for general? Not really, but there are cases where we relax the assumption of generalizability a bit, or relax the requirement. So these are samples where we have a few things that we need. We need, first of all, a large sample. We need it to be generalizable. We have a clearly identifiable population and quite often it's used in quantitative research. Most large scale social surveys, crime and justice, crime and victimization surveys will use um, will use a variety, uh, will use some variant of probability sampling. There's a few types and these are discussed in the readings. Uh, you can get into the readings yourself to check these through and the tutors again will be available to talk to you about this. Simple random samples are where we just, quite simply as it sounds, we use random number generation or we pick, uh, we pick a number of individuals at random with no other criteria other than that. Um, we don't introduce any controls or subgroups. Systematic random sampling is kind of the same. We just have a specific number in mind. If we have a thousand individuals, we need a sample of 200. Um, then we pick you know, a random number and we introduce a skip pattern and we select on that basis. The, the ones that are important, I think the main ones, the more common ones, are stratified sampling and multi-stage cluster sampling. The multi-stage cluster sample is the one that will be used in most commonly in large public surveys, like the crime and justice surveys we'll look at next week and the week after. Stratified samples are used where we want to address this problem of subgroup representation. This idea that we might possibly miss an important subgroup if we don't introduce an element of over or under selection. And guys, if you wouldn't mind, could you just mute yourselves um, unless you want to ask a question? There's just a little bit of, um, it's just a little bit of chat coming through, not chat, sorry, just a little bit of background noise coming through. So stratification is used 
uh, where we might have this case where there is likely to be a subgroup in there somewhere that we need to control for or keep an eye on. What we do is we introduce a strata, we introduce different layers. So if we were, do if we were doing a stratified sample in the case of the, uh, the Trump-Clinton or the Trump-Biden opinion polls, then what we would say there is we would say, okay, we know that there's likely to be an issue of class bias here somewhere. So we need representative, we need to ask people from both low income and high income households, then they become our strata. We say, I need a 1000 respondents, but I want 500 low income, I want 500 high income. And that's what stratification is. That's a stratified sample. So now what happens is, again, if we were just to take a simple random sample out of those 1000, we could end up with 900 low income or high income households, and we could end with 100 of the other or the opposite. The point is there, if we don't introduce any strata, we could end up with very, very small numbers somewhere of a group that we really want to study or look at. So stratified sampling, and again, stratified samples can include many, many different layers. The most common one is gender. You want to interview people of various genders. So you introduce a quota for that and you say, I want, or you introduce a strata for that, sorry. So I want to include people of these genders. I want to include people of these classes. Where it's, off, where it's also used would be things like uh, where you want to compare against or where you want to look at the attitudes or the characteristics of people who are not widely represented in the population. So if we think of social surveys and we think of small sort of social subgroups like, say, travellers, if we were to take a simple random sample from an electoral register, we're not going to get many travellers in that sample because there's quite a lot who won't be on the electoral register in the first place. If we're depending on the method of survey administration, we might not be able to reach them. But also because they are proportionally, they're a smaller per percentage of the population. That means that unless we introduce a strata and say, OK, I need more people from the traveling community, then they're going to be underrepresented and we're not going to be able to draw any conclusions about their specific experiences based on a simply random sample. Multi-stage cluster sampling then is used in large scale social surveys, as I said. And how this works is that it works from a series of uh, progressively smaller units. So multi-stage cluster samples are often are often drawn using geographical units. So we randomly select from hierarchically nested, nested units. And what are hierarchically nested units? If you look at the division of Ireland, we have Ireland is divided in many, many different ways. We've got provinces, counties, baronies, townlands, small areas, EDs, local authority areas. The Garda use different district designations as well, which makes it a bit more awkward. But if you think about this, first with provinces or counties, right, we could take a random sample of counties. And then within each of these counties, we could take a sample of small areas. The Central Statistics Office uses these small area designations to organize its small area statistics. And there's about 18,000 of them, just over 18,000 of them at the moment uh, in Ireland. Electoral districts are used for electoral purposes. And it escapes me the precise number of those, but I think it's about 5,000. Someone might want to fact check that for me. I'm not entirely sure. And some of these units can be quite large in the case of counties, and some of them can be quite small in the case of small areas. So it is costly to conduct, but it is considered the gold standard for the kind of socioeconomic research that would be nationally representative. So things like the Growing Up in Ireland Survey, Living in Ireland Survey, Survey of Income and Living Conditions, European Social Survey, would use variations on this multi-stage cluster sample. It's not as common to use random digit dialing anymore in things aside from like marketing and that. So this is the one that would ensure representation because we're randomly sampling within counties. And again, things like education surveys, they might sample uh, a small area, then they might sample a number of schools within that, and then they might sample classrooms within schools and then teachers within schools or whatever. So multi-stage simply means we keep going down and down and down to the smallest units until we get to individuals and households. The second type of sampling then is what we refer to as non-probability sampling. And this is where the probability of selection for each subject is not known. Why is it not known? Because typically when we use this type of sampling method, we don't have a sampling frame. We don't have a list of people that we want to sample from or that we might want to interview. And this is most obvious in criminology because oftentimes in studies that we find in criminology, we are dealing with sort of elusive or hard to reach or unknown populations. Um, not always, but often. And if you think about this, where would we get an exhaustive list of uh, people who have been through the probation system or where would we get a list of people convicted for particular categories of offense or people who had 
experienced a particular type of rehabilitation program or ex-prisoners or something. There's no list we could go to. In any case, we might not really want to do that. Maybe we want to look at or interview people with specialist knowledge. Um, in studies of prisoners and prison landings, let's say you might want to deal with or interview prison officers that have a very, very specific type of experience that have worked in a particular security category of prison, perhaps. In which case, randomly sampling from a list might not be the best, the best strategy. So when we're dealing with these very specific populations who are often elusive, sometimes hard to find, but where there's no sampling frame available, we're dealing with a non-probability sample. In this case, random selection is not employed. And there are reasons for this. Quite often, it's an advantage if you're looking for very specific people. It simply doesn't make sense to use random selection. It's also used for medium or small end samples. Generalizability is more limited because First of all, it's not randomly selected. We can't apply that same sort of projection assumption that we can with random samples. And also it tends to be used in qualitative research with qualitative data collection methods. So probability sampling, think of quantitative research, large scale social surveys, generalizability, large samples. Non-probability sampling, think small scale studies, limited generalizability and qualitative research methods. So things like interviews, participant observation, focus groups, uh, biographical interviews, things like that. The four types that are discussed in the textbook for this week in the chapter are availability or convenience sampling, purpose of quota and snowball sampling. And what each of these different ones means is availability or convenience is if you imagine standing outside the TSI building with the survey form and just handing it out to whoever came around. Um, that's what we mean by availability or convenience. You're just giving it to whoever happens to be available. And obviously that's not random because depending on where you stand on campus, there's probably going to be a selection bias. If you stood outside the science building or you stood outside the John Hume building, you're probably going to get different categories of people there. On one hand, you get science students in one building, you might get arts and social science students in another building. And they might have very, very different attitudes or be different in important ways that you might not necessarily know. So that's why availability or convenience sampling is generally discouraged from the point of view of generalizability because it's not something you should really be doing if generalizability is an aim. Purpose of sampling is, as I described there earlier, where you have a specific type of person or category of respondent in mind that you need to study and you need to purposefully seek them out. In studies of uh, high income or high net worth individuals, purpose of sampling is used to target billionaires, to target CEOs, to target hedge fund managers, if you need to talk to specifically that type of person. In criminology, you could use it to target or to recruit specific categories of person. Um, in the paramilitary study, the paper that you're going to read in tutorial, I think it's in week eight, you'll see that a, they employed a purpose of sampling method there. They needed to speak to ex-loyalist prisoners and they needed to speak to ex-republican prisoners. So they could talk about their transition into these community mediator, community leadership roles away from, uh, away from paramilitary and organized crime. Sorry, paramilitary violence and organized crime. Quota sampling is kind of like stratified sampling. It's where you have particular subgroups in mind and you want to ensure they're all represented. So in the case of a study of prison officers, you might define quotas based on gender. You might say, I want to talk to a number of male officers and I also want to talk to a certain number of female officers, transgender officers. Or the quotas could be established on the basis of class or education. You want to talk to people with uh, no formal uh, no formal degree you want to talk to people with a degree um, race and ethnicity are also common quotas and strata use uh, ethnicity is the example in the case of travelers uh, race you might want to study people of different races um, for various reasons possibly but principally because their attitudes or their responses are likely to differ or because you want to compare those groups against each other to see if there's any difference amongst them and then finally, snowball sampling is in the case of very hard to reach populations. You see this a lot in homeless studies. Uh, there's no registry or inventory of homeless people to go to to consult a sample from. So quite often you're dealing with onward referrals. So somebody you, you get one person and they say, oh, I know this person. They might talk to you. They refer you on to them. And then the sample accumulates like that. So the, to use the metaphor of the accumulating rolling snowball, which might be helpful or might not be. So snowball sampling is a system of onward referral where the initial respondent um, acts as a recruiter and then refers you onward to someone else. And then the next person refers you to someone else and it goes on like that. <coughs> One question that's often brought up is how big a sample needs to be. 
Lewis, do you need to include a plagiarism sheet? Uh, no, we don't require it. So, because you're submitting to us in the sociology department, um, we don't. Sorry, cover sheet. Do you mean the cover sheet? In that case, yes, you do, and I'll be making one available. Um, yeah, the cover sheet is the little thing you fill out with the declaration. Yeah, sorry, Lewis. Yeah, I'll make that. I'll make the cover sheet available to you on Moodle uh, closer to the assignment submission date. So, one question or one comment that I often get in assignments is. If, if there's a question in there about how to improve the quality of a study, people often say, oh, well, you could just add more people. You could make you could make the sample a bit bigger. It's not always advisable and not always necessary because there is actually kind of a saturation point or a point of diminishing returns where adding more people doesn't really add a whole lot in terms of the precision of your estimates. And most opinion polls have kind of reached an equilibrium where they're happy to sit at a margin of error of around 3%, which corresponds, again, this is assuming random selection, which corresponds to a margin of error of about 3%. And that gives a sample of about 1,000, 1,200. So what this graph is showing us is that at a sample size of about 1,000 or 1,200, you will encounter a margin of error of approximately 3%. Now, if we look at the shape of this, the shape of this curve, right, if this was just sort of a linear curve, a straight line, then there'd be a very kind of predictable diminishing returns based on each additional quantity of people based on each additional person but it's actually not it's a sort of curved looking thing that kind of flattens out the further over we go to the right what that means is if you look here if i have a sample of 1200 giving me an error of about three percent i add another 800 people that only brings me to about 2.5 percent margin of error but the resources and the cost involved in adding those 800 people on you can see given the shape of the curve and the diminishing returns really doesn't make it worth from a financial or a company point of view it doesn't make it worth the effort of recruiting those people and really if we're talking about getting down to an error of two percent we're looking at about a, a sample of about three thousand and now we're already quite far beyond this estimate here of one thousand one thousand two hundred we would have to add two thousand more people tripling the size of the study to reduce the margin of error by one percent which is why even for the U, for the united states you'll see that nationally representative samples are kind of they often use the same numbers that we would use in ireland which sounds a little bit kind of strange but as long as we follow the randomization assumption we're randomly selecting then we can in theory have equal confidence that in both territories the same sample size would yield the same margin of error and that sounds absolutely bizarre because intuitively we think that the sample has to be in proportion to the population that we would need to sample five percent of the u.s population and five percent of the irish population for it to be anyway comparable but that's actually not the case it deals quite well with absolute numbers so larger samples reduce the margin of error of a point estimate, and that's desirable from a statistical point of view. But in real terms, in practical terms, the cost of actually doing so really mitigates against this. The bigger issue and the more important issue is how heterogeneous the population is, how diverse it might be. We might need larger samples if there are larger between group differences. What that means is if there are, let's say, minority groups within the population, if especially if we think of the US, if there are ethnic minority groups, that might be more or less predisposed to vote for somebody to be more or less fearful of crime, let's say, then we need to account for that by introducing in our sample design strata. So we need to sample people within different ethnic groups, people of different ages, religions, genders, occupations, social classes, to ensure that we account for all of that heterogeneity. It's especially important if we want to start comparing and analysing, because the point of criminology is not just to collect information on who is afraid of crime and you know, to what extent are they? The point is that we want to explain that fear. To do that, we need to look at whether fear of crime varies in relation to other characteristics like gender, like age, like race, like ethnicity, which it does, and that's part of the explanation. But again, from a research point of view, in order to make those comparisons, we need to make sure that in our study we have people from all of those different subgroups. And that's where sampling comes in. This is where this kind of maintaining control over the sample quality comes in. So the two principal ways we do this probability sampling and a quantitative research design using strata or multi-stage selection and for non-probability samples in qualitative studies either purpose of selection quotas or using an onward referral system the project or the art the assignment um the first assignment also asks you to identify the research question uh, from your paper so research questions are quite broad in general they set out the scope of a whole project Something like a, re a research question could be something like, does inequality affect incarceration rates? But research questions 
um, can also be supplemented with what we find here, which is hypotheses. Um, so I'm actually going to come back to this one next week. I think I'm going to start with this next week because there's a bit of material on that. So for the moment, uh, keep an eye on your tutorial registration. Make sure you know where your venue is. Most of them are in TSI and John Hume, but a few of them are in uh, slightly awkward locations. One of them is in room 62, which is on the south campus. And I think one of them is in that pyramid shaped building. I can't remember the name of it. Um, whatever it is, Roy something. Anyway, sorry, just uh, check your um, check your outline, check your maps and uh, just send me an email if you have um, if you have any questions about it. OK, guys, that's all I have for you today. If you need to sign off, please do. I'll process the recording and I'll make it available on Moodle via a YouTube link. And I will hopefully all going well. See you in person next Monday. So have a good day. And to those of you who attended, thank you.